diabetic ketoacidosis uh, therapeutic considerations يعني ازاي بعالج diabetic ketoacidosis how to treat and manage a case with D K A Let's remember first from the previous lecture that in DKA we have a triad of hyperglycemia, ketosis, and metabolic acidosis. And the pathogenesis of DKA starts with insulin deficiency and ends up with hyperglycemia, ketosis, and metabolic acidosis with wide anion gap. Not to forget that due to osmotic diuresis, the patient is usually having dehydration and electrolytes depletion most importantly, I'd like you to remember potassium depletion. That's why in the treatment of DKA, one should consider giving insulin. One should consider rehydrating the patient. One should keep in mind that potassium is important and you need to give potassium supplements, one may consider correcting acidosis with a specific measures. So these are exactly the points that we are going to talk about in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. Reminding you with two important definitions, anion gap and corrected sodium. And as we agreed in a previous lecture that anion gap means sodium level minus the sum of chloride and bicarb. If it's more than 10, this means wide anion gap. Corrected sodium is important in patients with marked hyperglycemia, and it's the measured sodium plus 1.6 for each 100 milligram blood glucose above the 100 milligram per deciliter level. So, for example, if the patient is having a blood glucose of 300, so the patient is having 200 above 100 milligram. So you multiply 1.6 by 2. So it will be 3.2. So you add this 3.2 to the measured sodium reported by lab. This is how to calculate corrected sodium. And we're going to need this right now in the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. And as we agreed before that the severity of DKA is not dependent on the blood glucose level or how heavy is the ketone bodies, but the degree of metabolic acidosis. So you need to look at the bicarb. If you are in the range of from 15 to 18, you can manage your patients in emergency department. If the patient is having bicarb less than 15, so you need to manage your patients at intensive care unit. Treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis are, are going to answer this, these five questions. What is the role of hydration in DKA? How and why should we hydrate the patients presenting with DKA? How should we give insulin to the patients? 
Should we give potassium to every patient with DKA? Potassium supplements are important. What are the indications of bicarb therapy? Should we give bicarb or not? And if we're going to give bicarb, what should be the indication for that? And lastly, when can we start subcutaneous insulin, meaning resolution of DKA and shifting the patient from intravenous insulin to subcutaneous insulin? Let's start with the first question. Hydration of the patients presenting with diabetic ketoacidosis. Hydration is important to replace the fluid deficit, lower her blood glucose level, improve the insulin resistance, and maintain the renal functions. And please start rehydrating the patients immediately after diagnosis. And plan to give the fluid therapy over 24 hours. Rehydration should be the first line of treatment in DKA, even before insulin therapy, in importance and in order of implementation. Because fluids will correct dehydration, lower blood glucose, improve insulin sensitivity, and maintain and protect the kidney. Once you diagnose DKA, start to give the patients fluids and maintain the fluids over 24 hours. So what is the plan of giving fluid therapy in DKA. The standard fluid for rehydration in diabetic ketoacidosis should be saline. And you start with one liter of normal saline. Normal saline, I mean 0.9% saline. So start to give saline one liter of normal saline over one hour. And then assess corrected sodium. If the corrected sodium is low, you will continue with normal saline with a rate of 250 to 500 milli per hour. But if the corrected sodium is normal or high, you go on with half normal saline with the same rate. And you need to measure the sodium every two to four hours and correct the sodium per hyperglycemia and decide whether you will go with normal saline or you will go with half normal saline. So the decision of the decision of whether you will give the patient normal saline or half normal salines can be changed after two hours, after four hours. It's not all the time you give the same concentration of saline. I mean you should be dynamic. And do we see the same in insulin therapy, in potassium supplementation, in bicarb, and so on. And you need to measure the blood glucose every one hour in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. When the blood glucose reaches down to 200 milligram per deciliter, you add to, you add to the fluid therapy through a separate line glucose 5% in a rate of from 150 to 250 milli per hour because you want to keep the blood glucose in the range of 150 to 200 milligram per deciliter until resolution of DKA. And the point here is that 
you add glucose 5% because you are giving the patients insulin intravenous. And you do not want the blood glucose during the treatment of DKA to get lower than 150. For example, if you are starting with the blood glucose level of 400, and the blood glucose went after one or two hours, for example, to 90 or 80, this rapid drop of osmolarity can lead to cerebral edema. That's why you do not want the blood glucose during the treatment of DKA to go very low. You want it to be in the range of 150 to 200 rather than getting below 150. So again, how to rehydrate a patient with DKA? In the first hour, you give one liter of normal saline. After giving this one liter, calculate corrected sodium. If it's low, you go with normal saline. If the sodium is normal or high, you continue with half normal saline and the infusion rate should be from 250 to 500 milli per hour. Remember that you need to measure the blood glucose on hourly basis. And when the blood glucose reaches as low as 200 or less, you should give the patient glucose 5% through a separate line in a rate of 150 to 250 milli per hour. And the aim is to maintain the blood glucose in this range until resolution of acidosis. Please rehydrate decently and slowly and in the rate we described. And never ever allow rapid drop of osmolality to avoid the development of cerebral edema which can occur due to rapid drop of osmolality with rapid rehydration, with rapid drop of blood glucose, especially in children presenting with DKA. So this is the first question, hydration of DKA. After hydration, which should come first, the next question is, how should we give insulin? to a patient with DKA, having said that, insulin deficiency is the start, is the name of the game, is the beginning of the pathophysiology of DKA. How to give the patients insulin? Actually, insulin is very important in the management of DKA. Insulin corrects hyperglycemia. Insulin corrects ketosis, but take care. Insulin can be associated with hypokalemia. Insulin, as you know, leads to entry of potassium inside the cells. So the level of serum potassium gets lower. So the use of intravenous insulin can lead to hypokalemia. Please remember this. Because you should not start the patients with DKA on intravenous insulin except after measuring the serum potassium. Before starting insulin, and every two to four hours during treatment of DKA. And if the potassium is less than 3.3, if your patient is already hypokalemic, please do not give the patient insulin. Because profound hypokalemia 
can be arrhythmogenic and the patients can go into arrhythmia because of the marked hypokalemia and this would, would, would be then iatrogenic. You do not want to get your patients to life-threatening arrhythmia. So, so again, I am reminding myself, I'm reminding you that in a patient with DKA, never ever start the patient on insulin except after seeing his serum potassium level. And if the potassium is lower than 3.3, do not start insulin now. Correct first the hypokalemia. And after two hours, recheck the potassium level. If it's more than 3.3, you can start your patients on insulin therapy then. How to give the patients insulin in patients with DKA? We are using typically regular insulin, intravenous infusion. We start with bolus of regular insulin, 0.1 unit per kg. So if the patient's, for example, weight is 60 kilograms, you give the patient six units of regular insulin by intravenous bolus, followed by 0.1 unit per kg per hour by intravenous infusion. For example, if your patient is having, if the patient's body weight is 60 kilogram, so you give the patient six units of regular insulin per hour intravenous infusion. Should we continue the same rate of intravenous infusion of insulin for the whole course of treatment? Actually, no. What you will do is to measure the blood glucose by glucometer every hour, every one hour, and decide about the rate of insulin infusion according to the blood glucose level and modify the infusion rate of insulin to maintain the blood glucose as we've just mentioned between 150 to 2 milligram per deciliter until resolution of DKA. So again, we're using regular insulin by intravenous infusion, starting with bolus of 0.1 unit per kg, followed by continuous infusion of 0.1 unit per kg per hour. Every one hour, you need to measure the blood glucose and to modify this infusion rate according to the blood glucose level to maintain blood glucose level in the range between, in the range of 150 to 200 milligram per deciliter until resolution of DKA, typically in 12 to 24 hours. So this is the schedule of how to change the infusion rate of insulin. You want insulin to be, the blood glucose level to be in this range. So if you find after one hour, the blood glucose in this range, you just maintain the same infusion rate of insulin. For example, if the patient's weight is 60 kilogram, so you give infusion rate, you start with insulin infusion rate of six units per hour. After one hour, you measure the blood glucose and find it in this range. So you will continue with the same rate, six units per hour. And after one hour, you measure the blood glucose, you decide about the infusion rate. If the blood glucose is high, for example, you find it in the range of 200 to 250, 
increase the drip rate by 0.5. So if it's six, it will be 6.5 units per hour and reassess after one hour. If you find the blood glucose more than 250, for example, 300, you increase the drip rate by one hour, the six units per hour will be seven units per hour and reassessed after one hour and so on. On the other hand, if you find the blood glucose ranging from 100 to 150, decrease the drip rate by 0.5. So if you start by six units per hour, it will be 5.5 .5 units per hour. If the blood glucose went in the range of 70 to 100 milligram, you should not continue with insulin. Otherwise your patients will get into hypoglycemia. So stop insulin infusion, but you will not stop insulin infusion till tomorrow. You will stop insulin infusion for half an hour and then reassess the blood glucose and see in which range you are. And this will decide the infusion rate of insulin or still stopping insulin for another half an hour and so on. If your blood glucose went before 70 milligram per deciliter, so you have hypoglycemia, stop insulin infusion, correct the hypoglycemia by 100 milliliter of glucose 25% and recheck after 15 minutes, see the blood glucose and decide according to the blood glucose level, what will you do with insulin infusion? As you see here, it should be a dynamic process. Every one hour, you measure the blood glucose in a patient with DTA, and you decide according to the blood glucose level what should be the infusion rate of insulin and when to stop insulin and for how long will you stop insulin to reassess and then decide what should be done with insulin infusion. So this is the second point. How should we give insulin? Simply, it should be intravenous regular insulin. You start with 0.1 unit per kg bolus, and then 0.1 unit per kg per hour. And every one hour, on hourly basis, you check the blood glucose. And according to the algorithm we have just seen, you decide whether you will continue insulin infusion or temporarily stop an insulin infusion. And if you are going to give insulin infusion, at what rate? It depends on the blood glucose level. Sometimes, especially in pediatric age, in children, some investigators and some of the guidelines may recommend against giving bolus in starting the treatment. And the rationale is that when you go with osmolality rapidly down, when you decrease osmolality quickly, in young age, this can lead to increased risk of cerebral edema. So some of the guidelines in pediatrics recommend against giving a bolus. So you start by the infusion of 0.1 unit per kg from the start without giving bolus. So we have a debate in this point, but at the end of the day, you may be cautious about giving a bolus in a patient with if the patient is having young age in children. The third question is potassium. We have described potassium depletion in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Should we give then potassium to every patient with diabetic ketoacidosis? Well, I'd like here to revise 
a part in the physiology, which is very important, a fact that due to osmotic diuresis, the patients with DKA is having total body depletion of potassium. And when I am saying total body depletion of potassium, I'm talking about intracellular and extracellular potassium. However, due to metabolic acidosis, which can lead to shift of potassium from inside the cells to outside the cells in the serum, and the two insulin deficiency, and you know that insulin helps entry of potassium inside the cells. So insulin deficiency will lead to shift of potassium again from inside the cells to the serum, to extracellular components. So both metabolic acidosis and insulin deficiency will lead to shift of potassium from intracellular to extracellular components, I mean serum potassium level gets higher. That's why the serum potassium level in patients with DKA can be high or normal despite, despite the total body depletion of potassium due to metabolic acidosis and the two insulin deficiency. Why I'm saying this long introduction to potassium in DKA? Because simply you can decide to give potassium now and after two to four hours when measuring the potassium, the serum potassium, you say, okay, we need to stop potassium. After two to four hours, you always, okay, we I need to give potassium now, and so on. So, please, if you are planning to treat DKA, you should be sure that you have the facility to measure the potassium every two to four hours. So, in a place, not having a facility to measure the serum potassium every two to four hours, one should not, should not admit the patient for treatment of DKA. Because we mentioned before that when you give insulin, this will lead to hypokalemia. So if you are not sure that if my patient is already hypokalemic or not, and you give put insulin blindly, this can lead to fatal arrhythmia. So please, it's very important during treatment of DKA to measure the potassium every two to four hours. And you have all the possibilities there. For example, if the potassium is low, is less than 3.3, stop insulin. And if you haven't started insulin, do not start insulin now. Please postpone insulin therapy and give the patients 20 to 30 milli equivalent of potassium per hour. And recheck after two to four hours to get potassium in the normal range. This is a first possibility. The second possibility while checking the potassium level to find the potassium in the normal range. Normal range is from 3.3 to 5.2. Well, the potassium level is normal, so I shouldn't give potassium. No, remember you are giving insulin, continuous insulin IV infusion. And the insulin will lead to hypokalemia. So if the potassium level is normal, you will give supplementary potassium, 20 to 30 milli equivalent potassium for each liter of intravenous fluids. Please add 
20 milli equivalent potassium for every liter of intravenous fluids to avoid hypokalemia induced by insulin infusion and induced by correction of metabolic acidosis. Both will lead to entry of potassium inside the cells and can lead to hypokalemia. The last possibility is to find the potassium level more than 5.2. Means that, well, I'm having hyperkalemia. Should I give potassium then? No, you do not give potassium. But this decision is not until tomorrow morning. This decision is valid only for two to four hours. After two to four hours, you check potassium and find out at which status you are. And accordingly, you decide about giving potassium or not. And you decide about continuing with insulin infusion or not. This is about potassium therapy in the KA. The next question is bicarb. Should we give bicarb for a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis? And and it's you can simply say, well, you are saying that the patient is having metabolic acidosis, so it's logic to correct this metabolic acidosis by giving bicarbonate, like we are doing with, for example, metabolic acidosis associated associating renal failure in uremia or drug-induced metabolic acidosis, we give bicarb. So will we give bicarbonate therapy for every patient with diabetic ketoacidosis? And actually, we have much of debate here. We have a lot of controversy here. It's well known that metabolic acidosis can lead to impairment of myocardial contractility and it can lead to serious GIT complications. So this goes with correction of metabolic acidosis with bicarb. Yet, the use of bicarbonate therapy in DKA is really a very serious decision to take. Because when you're giving bicarb, you can induce hypokalemia, and we are already giving insulin, which can lead to hypokalemia. Giving bicarb can lead to change of osmolality, leading to precipitation of cerebral edema, especially in young age. And by giving bicarbonate therapy in a patient with DKA, this can lead to a condition called paradoxical CNS, central nervous system acidosis. And it's a very long story, but simply when you give bicarb for a patient with DKA, the bicarb will lead to increased level of CO2, hypercapnia. CO2 will pass through the blood-brain barrier and lead to increased acidosis of the CSF. Whereas, due to bicarbonate, the pH in the serum in the blood is alkaline. That's why it's called paradoxical, because the pH of the blood is, is alkaline and the CSF pH is acidic. This is called paradoxical CNS acidosis. We do not know very much about the pathophysiology of paradoxical CNS acidosis, how exactly it, it, it happens. But we know very well that the prognosis of a patient having paradoxical CNS acidosis is very bad. So the controversy here about 
giving bicarbonate therapy by cup in patients with DKA that severe metabolic acidosis can be life-threatening, yet bicarbonate therapy in a patient with DKA can lead to, again, life-threatening conditions. So the rule in DKA that, well, I will not give bicarb. I'll give fluids, I'll give insulin, and this should correct the metabolic acidosis, except in very, very low pH. So during the treatment of DKA, you need to measure the pH every two to four hours. You need to perform ABG analysis for the patient every two to four hours. And if the pH is 6.9 or more, no bicarb is indicated. Only and only if the pH went below 6.9, which is severe metabolic acidosis, which is life-threatening metabolic acidosis, you give then bicarb. You do not plan here or aim here for total correction of acidosis or half correction of acidosis, you just give here 100 millimole plus 20 milli equivalent potassium chloride over two hours. All what you want to do is to reach the pH to seven. You do not want to get the pH with bicarb to normal pH because with insulin and the fluids the pH will go higher. So to summarize bicarbonate in DKA is not indicated except if the pH is less than 6.9. The last question here after giving fluids, insulin, potassium, and the if indicated by carb therapy, when can we shift the patient from intravenous insulin to subcutaneous insulin? In other words, when, when do decide that, well, the patient has recovered from DKA and we need to shift the patient from intravenous insulin to subcutaneous insulin and to get the patient from the ICU to the ward. Well, recovery of DKA, resolution of DKA is defined by two of these three following criteria. It means the bicarb is more than 18, the pH is more than 7.3, and the anion gap is less than 10. If you have two out of the three criteria, this means that the metabolic acidosis has recovered, and the anion gap went back to normal, then the patient has recovered from DKA and is ready to shift him from IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. As you can notice here, it's not dependent on the blood glucose level because simply the blood glucose level with the first two or three hours of intravenous insulin will go back to normal, will go down to normal. So it's not about the blood glucose level. Recovery of DKA, resolution of DKA means correction of acidosis rather than getting blood glucose lower. Subcutaneous insulin therapy can be started after recovery of the patient, but take care. If you are planning to start him on regular insulin, 
you need to allow overlap one to two hours between stopping IV insulin and starting subcutaneous insulin. Because you know that regular human insulin and NPH, they take one or two hours after subcutaneous injection to show some action. So if you stop the intravenous insulin and give the patient human insulin, so regular insulin or NPH, in this one or two hours, the patients can get rebound ketosis, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes with absolute insulin deficiency. Because you know that the T half of intravenous insulin is few minutes. So if you st stop intravenous insulin and the patient is type 1 diabetic and the subcutaneous insulin is still not absorbed yet, the patient can get rebound DKA. So you allow, should allow overlap between one to two hours before stopping IV insulin and the starting subcutaneous insulin. For insulin analogs, rapid acting analogs like aspart, glulysine, or lispro, these analogs start immediately after subcutaneous injection. You do not need such overlap. So with rapid acting analogs, you can give the subcutaneous insulin and they stop the intravenous insulin immediately. There is no fear of and no concern about rebound ketosis. Well, you start the patient on basal bolus insulin regimen with basal insulin and short acting or rapid acting insulin at meal time, and you titrate the dose of basal insulin with fasting blood glucose, you titrate the dose of prandial insulin with two hours post prandial blood glucose, but actually this titration can be done in at home. You do not need ICU for titrating the doses of basal bolus insulin regimen. Once the patient is not having acidosis, the patient can be discharged from the intensive care unit and be followed at outpatient clinic for titration of the insulin dose. So these are the lines of treatment of DKA. I hope now we know well how to hydrate patients with DKA, how to give insulin, how to give potassium, and when to give bicarb for patients with DKA, if ever, and when you decide that my patient has recovered and I can shift him or her to subcutaneous insulin and discharge the patient out of ICU. Thank you very much for attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.